fine. Um, and um, we are having a brief introduction into, into DiscourseNet and, and the DiscourseNet seminar series by Johannes first, and then um, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. So over to Johannes. Hello, everybody. It's uh, a great pleasure to see you all here. Um, I'll say a few words about DiscourseNet, uh, which is the association behind uh, this uh, seminar series. DiscourseNet is a multilingual and international association for discourse studies. It's open to all disciplines, uh, not only to linguistics. And uh, we're interested in the social production of meaning um, at the crossroads of language and society. Um, DiscourseNet has existed as a formal association for about three or four years. Uh, but it's a network that um, has been around for, for many years, and um, it's been animated by um, discourse uh, aficionados who um, are interested in, um, in, in questions of language and power, of uh, the question of how we use language in order to engage in social practices, in, in many other questions. And, um, and we are open to all kinds of orientations uh, of um, all kinds of um, uh, projects. Uh, we are not uh, representing a particular school and uh, we want to make sure that um, there's a great deal of um, openness um, to, to the many new people who enter the field. If you want to become um, active in DiscourseNet, you're very much uh, welcome. Uh, we'll send around the link uh, with the information about the membership and uh, of course, um, your contribution will be very much appreciated. Um, uh, the infrastructure, the web page uh, that, that you all know uh, is very uh, important and needs some, some support uh, from, uh, from the many people who work in our field. So um, if, if you want to, um, uh, to become active, just let us know. We are always very, um, are very happy to talk things through. And um, yeah, so... Um, I'll give over to um, uh, Michael again, right, Michael? Yeah. Um, so just before we start, just to say uh, this session is recorded. Uh, so if you don't want to be seen on the recording, then don't put your camera on. Um, I think we're probably going to have enough time for questions in the end, but you can also put your questions in the chat, which we'll put uh, to Michael and um, yes. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Michael Ferrelli. Uh, who is a senior lecturer uh, at University of Hull. Uh, Michael works on political discourse. He's worked on critical discourse analysis and, and local democracy and the new labor. Um, is currently working on discourses uh, and the climate crisis and together with uh, Nicolina Montesano Montessori and Jane Molderick has uh, published a nice volume on critical policy discourse analysis and I think we're going to hear a bit more about discourse and policy and policy failure today. So I'm really looking forward to this very much. Over to you, Michael. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks very much for the invitation to speak. It's a great honour and great pleasure. Um, I don't think I'm going to be talking about sustainability, well, kind of slightly related, but 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 something slightly different. So I'm going to be talking about policy analysis. So yeah, can, can policy, can discourse analysis predict policy failure? So for me, it's an intriguing and tempting idea to think so. Um, on one level, it's a routine and common activity to engage with political and policy texts and judge their merits. Policymakers, politicians, journalists, citizens read and listen to and assess policy texts or parts of policy texts or reports about policy texts on a daily basis. And then fairly or unfairly, the likely success or failure of policies is judged on a reading of policy texts uh, or texts about policy proposals. However, my question, the question for this paper, uh, concerns the prospect of a potentially more systematic analysis of policy texts in terms of the likelihood of policy failure. And, and this is a work in progress. Um, the way I'm going to do this is kind of retrospectively and look at two policy areas that we might judge as having failed on the one hand and another perhaps having more success and seeing if we can match up what's successful and what's failing about those policies with some of the the discourse the text that pre prefigure those um those policies 
So as uh, Michal has uh, mentioned, I'm going to, I propose to examine this question with reference to critical policy discourse analysis. Uh, and this approach seeks to make a distinctive contribution to the analysis of actually existing policy problems by integrating and building on critical discourse analysis on the one hand and critical policy studies on the other. Uh, you can see a picture of our book there, along with many other com uh, contributors, uh, Jay Mulderig and Nicolina Montessori, Mont Montesano Montessori and myself uh, in this edited book, uh, we presented 10 empirical case studies that attempted to demonstrate how critical policy discourse analysis can enrich um, the conceptualization and the analysis of policy. And in one of those case studies, my own case study, I argued that analysis of how policymakers and legislators represent social actors, so that will be familiar with people, for, for people who know critical discourse analysis and the work of Van Leuven. So I argued that analysis of representation of social actors could give valuable insight into how they conceptualized objects of governance. And specifically, um, I showed that we can analyze the representation of social actors to show how an object of governance, and in that particular case, and I'm going to speak about it again today, the, the British gas industry was being conceptualized discursively, and how evident flaws in that discourse, in that conceptualization, which included the absence of competitors, represented consumers as passive recipients of the benefits of competition. And, and I argued that th those two flaws in the discourse foreshadowed actual problems uh, in the implementation of competition in the UK gas industry. The lack of competitors uh, and low rates, of, low rates of, of consumer participation in switching supplier. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on. But this paper, as I say, it's a work in progress. Um, but I'm hoping to show how additional discourse analytical tools, m most of which should be familiar with, with people here, might be used to map out and critique the con concept formations, what I'm calling concept formations, that are crucial to policy making and communication. The idea of concept formations is grounded yeah, in critical discourse analysis and pol cultural political economy, which I'm not going to go into uh, particularly. Um, so am I on my next slide? Yeah. So, yeah, what is policy failure? Um, academic work in policy analysis in the field of, of, of policy analysis has put forward numerous approaches and definitions of policy failure, what counts as policy, policy failure. But for the purposes of this paper, I'm going to take uh, a definition put forward by um, McDonnell, who said that a policy fails even if it is successful in some minimal respects, if it does not, and this is the key, it does not fundamentally achieve the goals that proponents set out to achieve, and opposition is great or support is virtually non-existent. So I'm just going to take that for the purposes of this paper. Unlike the author, I don't think uh, that this is a comprehensive definition of policy failure. Um, for me, it corresponds to what critical realists would see as an immediate critique, that is critiquing an issue on its own terms, which for me is, is good enough for this paper. It doesn't produce, provide a, a transcendent critique, critiquing the issue on, on wider cr criteria. Um, but it's, it's good enough for this, for this particular paper. On the one hand, the privatisation of British gas is an example of policy failure, hence the pictures there. And I'm going to also talk about something called the Preston model of community wealth building as a contrasting um, example of something that, that could be seen as, as a relative policy success. So competition and cooperation being these two concept formations that, that uh, sort of around which those policy, the discourse of those policies was, was hinged. Uh, what, what I'm going to do, or what I propose, is that we diagnose potential problems in policy initiatives um, uh, where they attempt to incorporate general ideas into specific policies. So general ideas like competition and cooperation. Um, and what I've put there is that these general ideas encapsulate in single words or short phrases 
com uh, that are common in policy development, things like knowledge-based economy from many years ago, sustainability, equality, et cetera, et cetera. So policies, if you look at policies, they very often hang around these kind of generalized words that you, that you see again and again. Um, and you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to look at how, how competition and cooperation as, as policy concept for net formations are elaborated upon in, 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 in several examples of, 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 of texts. So the first case is the privatization of, of, of UK gas. And I think perhaps it's coming a little bit more topical now. Um, I would characterize uh, or say that the, the meta governance of, of um, energy in the UK has not been good over the past 30 to 40 years. It's characterized by whim, ideological pre predisposition, um, concerns about elections, rather than successful argument about how best to govern energy uh, and, 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 uh, and so on. UK energy provision was redefined during the 1980s in the public rhetoric markets and competition were going to govern gas government was not going to govern gas according to the rhetoric so by 1979 the incoming government which we'll all be familiar with formed uh, from the conservative party of margaret thatcher had won a general election it had a predisposition, as we know toward the privatization of public industries and it was a pre disposition which they justified as a catch-all corrective as they saw it to what they represented as problems of national debt inefficiency uh, in public industries high consumer prices for household gas and electricity and so on um, and an early indication of how this predisposition was to affect policy was an ad hoc announcement by the then secretary of state for energy in parliament that private firms were to be allowed to sell gas to state owned retailers and this announcement um, was made off the cuff it was news to the staff in his department who had no idea that these plans were were, were, were to be made in 1981 nigel lawson you can see a very grainy photograph of him in black and white there was appointed secretary of state for energy and he famously was a keen privatizer in the beginning of 1982 he gave um he, he famously said that the proper business of government is not the government of business um and by june he was saying that our task rather is to uh, set a framework which ensure that the market operates with a minimum of distortion and energy is produced and consumed efficiently this rumbled on for a time in 1983 parliament passed the energy act uh, and this allowed private interests to, to sell gas um, academic assessment of this uh, according to pearson watson the act had little effect and did not lead to a significant increase in private power generation um, they they go on to say that much has been written about the struggle between Nigel Lawson and, and Peter Walker, who became Energy Secretary, um, and the Chairman of British Gas, who uh, and, and they had various uh, struggles. They wanted uh, they were discussing whether we we're going to have regional models or central central centrally um, controlled vertically integrated industry. Uh, Lawson lost out on that and, and, and we ended up with a kind of fudged um, fudged privatization. Um, yeah, academics, you know, retrospectively have also kind of characterized this this privatization as being ineffectual. Um, it was seen in, in policy literature, people look at this kind of thing as having been driven through in order to demonstrate that privatization would be a good idea ahead of the the 1983 general election so it was kind of put forward as a as a, a demonstration that privatization could work so they did everything they could to make that privatization privatization seem as though it was working but um what we can see um here's here's what here's some couple of quotes on how they spoke about the privatization of British Gas. I want to pick out a couple of things. Um, the record of the House of Commons shows that for the past 20 years, whenever the Conservatives have been in power, the Labour opposition has been strongly criticised, uh, strongly criticised the enormous increase in gas prices. So 
the increase in gas prices was one of the things that the Conservative government was trying or claiming to solve through the privatisation of British gas. You can see in the second box, our legislation will provide a form of price control and protection for the consumer. So these are the kinds of things that they're saying that privatisation will provide. If British gas is to succeed, they say it will need to, to try not to retain, but to increase its share of the market. The idea that it will do so by increasing prices is wrong. So you can see many examples of how their policy aim in privatisation was strongly predicated on the reduction in consumer prices. So going back to how can we judge policy failure? Well, if we take them at their word, and that was their aim, if their aim was to reduce policy um, uh, consumer prices, um, well, here's a graph of consumer prices from privatization up to 2013, which, which is the last time I kind of updated these, these figures. You can see that initially there was a fall in gas prices that's because they put price control on, on gas, not because of competition, they put a price control, which was uh, uh, dictated by the formula RPI, Retail, retail Price Index, um, uh, plus 1%, sorry, sorry, minus 1%. So they would take whatever inflation was, take that off the price of, of consumer gas and uh, take an additional 1% off that. So the price control, meant that there was a reduction in, in gas prices for a long period. The red dotted line in the center of that graph indicates the time when the, by that time, Labour government of Tony Blair removed that price control. So from that point, it's from that point that we can see the effects of competition. And you can see from that point when there was open competition, prices rose almost every year uh, for um, more than a decade. And as we know now, have kind of shot through the roof. So the idea that competition um, reduces gas prices, you can see that, that that's on, on those terms, it's, there's, a, there's a failure. Um, on the second criteria of policy failure in McDonald's, McDonald's definition, is it a popular? Well, <laughs> It's hard to tell, but but new polling by opinion opinion, which from from last year found that uh, more than fifty percent of the public would back taking energy companies back back into public ownership, and only ten percent would be against um, taking energy companies back into public ownership. So you know it's not popular policy either. So it fails on its own terms, and it's also not popular. Um, so I'm I'm claiming it as a as a policy failure. Um, What's this got to do with discourse? Well, my analysis uh, here is that you can see you can see all the problems of British gas foreshadowed in the discourse in the in the, in the texts. Uh, we had um, we have high consumer prices, and in the discourse there was very little um, or, or no uh, description, no description at all about what the mechanisms of competition were going to be. It was simply left as competition will reduce prices. Nothing about the no, no, no elaboration on what those mechanisms of competition might be. Um, in recent times, um, there have been allegations of cartel behavior amongst the energy providers. Um, again, in the discourse, there is a near absence of competitors, who the competitors were going to be absent from from the policy texts from the parliamentary discussion of these things. Another problem that's been touted as, as why uh, to, to explain why consumer prices are so high is the allegation that can poor, that there are poor rates of consumer switching. If we look at the discourse, we find that there are um, wherever consumers are mentioned in that discourse in those policy texts, invariably they're in a passive position. They don't do anything actively. They, they just simply receive the benefits. So no wonder um, consumers end up not actively going and seeking out new energy providers. They were never seen uh, to, to, or thought of as, as doing that and, and therefore no mechanisms were ever provided for them to, 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 to go out and actively seek lower prices. Um, so that's the first case. The second case, so we are, I will show some, some examples later on. Um, the second case is the case, which is a more positive one, the case of the Preston model. So Preston is a um, small city, a market town formerly in the northwest of England in, in Lancashire. There's a red dot there showing its location. 
Um, you can see it's quite an old city. You can see a cathedral, a, a church spire there. And it's also a city that is not always, has not always um, under control of a Labour council, but, but generally it is. And you can see I took this photograph um, it, during one of the elections recently. I know we've had so many, but we, it, we and, I, and I can't now remember <laughs> which one it was. But this is outside a cafe, um, Tory free zone. And I'm not saying that everybody in Preston votes Labour or is anti-Tory. That's not the case at all. But I do think it's indicative that a business feels confident enough that it can put a sign such as this outside and not feel that it's going to turn away so many so many customers or put off so many customers that, that they'll that they'll lose out. So that, that's that's where Preston is. Um, why do I want to talk about Preston? Well, there's a thing going on in Preston, which has come to be known as the Preston model. Um, and you can see you can see what I've, I've put about it here. It's uh, the Preston model is a, a model of local economic development which seeks to implement policies of community wealth building. Uh, it's a deliberate effort to create and implement a new model of local governance in England that simultaneously serves the material, social and health needs of the population uh, and to empower them um, economically and politically. That's what they set out to do, the, the, the local council. So the Preston model combines local procurement by anchor institutions. So they encourage what they call anchor institutions, the local NHS, the police, the fire service, the university, and so on. They encourage them to buy locally and to prefer to, to, to procure things from local businesses. And, and they, they've started to do that. And so is the city council. The City Council promotes worker-owned cooperative businesses. It's, it's set up a, a number of initiatives to um, uh, allow people who are coming through the local colleges and university to um, go into business, but to go into cooperative businesses, not your kind of traditional um, uh, owner, an owner and employee model. There are there's a partnership between the local university, UCLan, the city council, and something that is set up called the Preston Cooperative Development Network. Um, and in terms of success or failure, under this model, there has been a clear positive effect. So in 2012 to 2013, out of 750 million spent on goods and services by the six anchor institutions. 5% uh, was spent in Preston and 39% in Lancashire as a whole. Three years later, after the model took effect, um, 620 million spent on goods and services by the same anchor institution. So that's 19% was spent in Preston and 81% in, in the wider Lancashire area. So a huge increase in what is spent locally. Um, and this has had an effect. Uh, official employment figures during the, the kind of recent recessionary periods show that the um, that Preston booked the national trend. It, it, its unemployment did not go down as much, uh, sorry, did not increase as much as the national average. So, so people stayed in work much more um, during recent recessions than, than, than the national trend would suggest. Is it a success? Is it popular? Well, there are no opinion polls on this. I, I can only say that uh, the local council, the local Labour council have continued to be elected uh, as, as, the, as, the, as the ruling um, party in the city. Uh, perhaps another model for understanding whether it's whether it's successful or not, it's had a lot of media attention. So there are positive portrayals of the Preston model in the print media across the political spectrum. So you've got positive models in the Daily Mirror, the Independent, the Guardian, the Times and the Telegraph, all of them have got reports in and opinion pieces which give praise for the, uh, the, the Preston model. So on these on these measures, we could I would suggest that we can see the Preston model as being a successful um, policy. There's a model, there's a diagram of, of what the Preston model kind of tends to be cooperative being the uh, the operative word there. Right. So what do I what what do I propose in terms of analyzing the text around these two policies in terms of critical policy discourse analysis? Well, the first idea is to take uh, 
those key concepts. So on the one hand, competition, and on the other hand, cooperation, and look at, uh, analyze things that we're familiar with. The wording, I'm calling it wording, but you may argue with that, inc to include representation of social actors, representation of action, representation of circumstances, um, to look at conceptual metaphors, to understand the underlying framework for, for how these contexts and, and policies are understood, to look at the semantic relations, to show how elements of a text relate to each other and also to look at inter and inter intratextual relations to understand which knowledge is being used to conceptualize these uh, these ideas um so what have i got next right so yes yeah, so let's move on to 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 some examples so these this example here is um taken from a parliamentary debate in 1985, when politicians were debating whether or not to privatise British gas. And this is a, a quote from the Minister for Energy at the time. And I, what I propose to do is, is kind of go through and pick out some of the key features in terms of um, the, the textual representation of competition and link that to some of the failures that we see in, 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 in the, the actual um, realization of privatization so the first one there therefore the industrial sphere is sorry in the industrial sphere we can claim that the bill's provisions which meet the views on regulations the body such as the cbi have given to the select committee comply with what is required and will assist there are other ways in which this legislation improves the position of the competition particularly with regard to competition in common carriage okay we don't necessarily need to understand precisely what he's talking about but in terms of social actors in relation to the social action to compete the representation of social actors is absent so if you if you if you look at um competition there the competition and competition so i've highlighted those in green there are no social actors there who represent those social actors who are going to do the competing they're not there uh, as i said earlier and this is typical this is typical of the discussion uh, on, on this issue um I've looked very carefully at the entire parliamentary debates and some of the policy texts uh, around that, and there's no point when I see government ministers referring to those entities which would be the competitors in this new regime of competition. They're just absent. Um, if we think about this in terms of social action, uh, competition is represented uh, as a thing, not a process. So the competition and then the nominalization competition. So again, represented as a thing, not a process. And in terms of circumstance, there is no mention of domestic supply here. There's no mention of the main purpose of, of introduced competition, which is to reduce domestic prices for consumers. They just don't talk about it. Um, all of which I would suggest prefigures uh, the lack of competition that we saw in subsequent years. We've got monopoly, virtual monopolies uh, with, with the big six energy companies. In terms of um, semantic relations, well, you can see what I've, I've done there. Um, the, um, yeah, the semantic relations being the, between the, the, the clauses and sentences um, are of the are, are all additive and elaborative. So in this case, the additive and elaborative relations leave significant gaps in the conceptualization of competition. Um, it does not show how the bill meets the views of bodies, which are quoted there, nor which um, bodies other than the CBI hold these views we're not shown how the provision complies with what is required. Um, and we're not shown actually what it is that's required, who has these requirements, we're not shown how they will assist. Uh, the second additive relation implies that the previous representation described improvement to the position in the competition, but the details are not described. There are no semantic relations of cause here, no reason for why the position of competition must be improved. There are no consequences of an improved position for competition or purpose uh, for an improved position. 
none of these things are elaborated upon in the semantic relations. And again, I'm talking about one example here, but this is typical of how competition is represented in these policy texts. And what, so what's the connection there? Well, this um, I, I think exemplifies the lack of detail that uh, was affected in the privatization and which then foreshadows that that um, rather unthought out um, ideologically driven privatization. In terms of intertextuality, and I'm also intratextuality, so within the text, um, we've got um, there's no intratextual reference um, uh, to, to any other parts of the speech. I, I mean, I'm not going to make a big deal about that, but the intertextual references there are kind of quite interesting. There is reference to the bill's provisions rather than just to the bill. It's, you know, more specific, it's a specific quality that's referred to. Um, there's a reference to an amalgam of unspecified texts. Um, so uh, with, a, with, with largely unspecified authors. So in the example of such as the CPI, so we're not, we're not told what, what text there we're talking about they um um so what am i so which which meet the views on regulations that bodies such as the cbi have given so we, we're talking about you know there must have been a text if if the cbi has given its views it must have done so either by speech or a written text but we're not told which specific text we're not told you know, who the which which elements of the cbi and so on are in there so again a kind of vagueness that 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 is kind of typical of, of how this evidence, how this knowledge, how these opinions are kind of gathered together in this. There's an ambiguous reference to what is required, which sounds very impressive, but as I've said earlier, we, we don't know what, who, who's requiring that. What are those requirements? Where are these requirements uh, documented? We're given to know, um, we're not given to know whether this is actually a real reference to a text or, or an agreed upon document or a research paper uh, on requirements. We're not giving anything uh, as to, as to, to what, what those requirements and where, where they're written down. There's a, a kind of unspecified assumption of a shared understanding of what's required. And what I would suggest is that there isn't a shared understanding. It's an assumption uh, and it remains an assumption and that assumption was carried through into how this policy was um, was implemented. There was never any clear idea of what the purpose of the policy would be and, and, and how you would get to it. Um, so again, the intertextual, intertextual analysis suggests that the conceptualization of competition in the governance of British gas is, is both vague and lacking in detail. And it's typical uh, of, of all the text that, that, I, that I've, um, I've looked at in this. If we move on now to um, the idea of cooperation, and this time in, in, the, in the Preston model. Now, this is a little bit more difficult to get texts about um, um, in terms of looking at city council uh debates on this they're not transcribed in the same way as, as national ones in so what i'm doing here is looking at a piece a chapter that i produced for another uh, edited book about media representations of the preston model and i'm just taking that as a, a kind of a proxy for, for how people discuss this and how we think about it and what i'm saying in this um is that um the proponents of the preston model have a far more elaborate uh representation of what the the Preston model is and I think that reflects um the fact that the Preston City Council is far more open in its presentation of what it's trying to do and actually far more sophisticated in developing and presenting what it's trying to do with its policy how it is going to implement that policy and how it understands its own weaknesses and attempts to develop um, methods for, um, how could I put it, methods for uh, overcoming those difficulties. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm saying it's a much better kind of, much more elaborate understanding of what, of what it is. So in this, we've got, um, uh, this is one of the, um, 
a kind of an explicit uh, um, supportive model from from a report from the independent newspaper written by a journalist called Hazel Sheffield. Um, the social actors here are in bold um, and the social actions are italicized. I don't know if you can make that out. Hopefully you can. So the Preston Council is supporting the, the development of new businesses, as you can see, in the city, organizers, cooperatives, where profits are shared between workers rather than external shareholders. Matthew Brown, Preston Council leader, sees co-ops as one way to reorganize power within the economy, We're going to be taking it from shareholders in the city of London and putting it into the hands of local workers. So here, it of course, is a different type of text, so I don't want to make too much of that. But for instance, we see named individuals and their governance role. So Matthew Brown, the Preston Council leader. Um, social actors here are categorized by economic role. So workers, businesses, shareholders. And there are some specification of details in place, uh, details of place, London, local. Uh, there are actions here, including supporting development, sharing profits, reorganizing power, taking and putting power. All of these are actions. Um, these actions have a level, do have a level of abstraction, being about power, power and organization. But there's also a representation uh, of what, what you can see as being a more concrete action, sharing profit. So unlike the, 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 the uh, discussion of British gas, there's far more detail, far more pe people here, far more concrete actions. So I would suggest that we've got a more elaborate and actually more realistic and more helpful discursive representation of, 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 of how the policy is going to uh, come in, is, is going to be effective. Uh, here. I forgot to talk about um, conceptual metaphors in the previous examples, but I'll, I'll talk about about something here, uh, you know, just as an example, we've got here a conceptual model where if we look at the 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 idea of reorganizing power within the economy, taking it from shareholders in the city of London and putting it in the hands of, of local workers. Well, we've got a conceptual metaphor which sees power as an object, a physical object, which can be passed uh, a, 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 amongst people. Power is understood as being like something that we can, can, can be taken from one social actor and put it into the hands of another. Um, this is, I guess this is a common shorthand way of representing power, but I do think we can question this because Power is not literally an object that can be taken and given. It needs a lot more uh, elaboration. And, and to me, this is one of the weaknesses of, 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 of the discourse of the Preston model is that it does rely on this kind of mo this, this, um, this metaphorical representation of power and quite often doesn't quite, to my mind, um, give enough detail of precisely what power is, how it's going to be taken from uh, in this case, shareholders in London and given to local people. It's not, not always uh, elaborated. So there's one potential problem um, for how the Preston model is affected. In terms of semantic relations, um, just to go through that one, um, uh, as in the previous example, the semantic relations are, are largely elaborative and additive. But there's also some contrastive relations here. So workers contrasted with shareholders as the beneficiaries of profits. Um, so there, there's a slightly more elaborate kind of uh, representation there. But similar to the previous example, there are no semantic relations of cause, no reasons, no consequences or purposes in this particular example. And I think um, from, from my uh, wider analysis, that's also pretty typical. So again, a, a kind of potential flag there for how how the presser model might need to be elaborated slightly in, in a slight in more detail in terms of intertextuality um there's again there's no obvious uh, there are no obvious intra or intertextual relations in, in in this example um but there are points where an intertext is likely to exist but hasn't been represented so some text or texts have informed the journalist that Preston Council is supporting the development of new businesses, but it's not mentioned that that text isn't mentioned specifically. Second, some text or other com has communicated to the journalist Matthew Brown's views on co-ops, but we're not given uh, that source information directly. Um, the source of these views is an important part of how cooperation is being conceptualized. Um, but in this example, at least the source of that understanding, uh, likely from the city council and its leader, uh, not from citizens or workers or industrial groups, but it, but it's kind of disguised there. So again, in in the kind of spirit of 
critical, friendly criticism, I would suggest that a potentially better way to think about, to, to kind of think about and discuss and uh, the, the, the press model would be to go not to the city council, which of course is going to promote it, the success of its own initiative, but to go to those people who are allegedly supposed to benefit from it, citizens, workers, individual, industrial groups, and so on. Okay, so, um, yeah. As I say, it's a kind of work in progress. And what I've tried to do is look back at two contrasting examples of policy. One I'm presenting as a failure around the idea of competition. One I'm presenting as, as more successful around the idea of competition. But what I want to suggest in terms of discourse and text analysis is that you can see some of the failures foreshadowed in, in, in certainly in the case of the British gas and some of the successes uh, of the Preston model um, reflected in the, the media discourse around those. So that's where I am so far. Um, yeah, I think there's evidence there that there's certainly a connection between how something is discussed and how you end up um, having policies affected or not. And, and I would suggest that there's a good potential that this kind of detailed analysis may provide a, a, at least one method of diagnosing potential policy failure and potentially success. Um, but I'm look forward to seeing what you all think about that. Yes, brilliant. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. So um, the floor is open to questions, comments. Uh, I think we are, yeah, if you just want to put your hands, use the hands up symbol and then we so you can turn your microphones uh, and, and cameras on if you have a question. Uh, and uh, the first question goes to your highest. <laughs> can you see me? I yep. don't know. Okay, interesting. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, that's really great um, to see um, uh, work on a real problem. <laughs> I mean, just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I see the, um, uh, the the question. I think it's a very innovative um, way to tackle it um, because um, you, you start from real world empirical um, problems and then uh, try to mobilize discourse analysis to um, to see how how these different aspects um, intersect. Um, like I mean, the general kind of political um, dynamics of of ideological positioning of um, policy making in terms of regulations, laws, etc. So um, I mean, <clears throat> where one might challenge you a bit is on on the way that um, that you refer to the, those programmatic, uh, programmatic texts as um, as representative of of discourse and the policy field because of course i mean these programmatic texts have very specific functions in very specific situations and um, it's it's uh, it's not always um, quite easy to see how how they hang together with all kinds of other texts practices um, events and um, in this case I would su suggest perhaps that that the general programmatic texts are always quite um, quite um, quite ambivalent open to all kinds of interpretation because these political actors um, which are behind those texts and uh, documents uh, they address a very very a uh, large social space of all kinds of different actors, interests, expectations, um, all kinds of din dynamics. And so um, um, on the most, um, on, on the uppermost level of, of political um, dynamics on the national level, perhaps on, 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 on the more kind of general public sphere level, um, I guess those texts are mostly there to, to mobilize people it's um it's to they are to um to to give identities to define positions um, of of the large political movements actors uh, it is about left and right um especially in the uk where 
the, the uh, electoral system uh, forces people to always take position for one or the other side. And, um, and, and so um, this is a very um, uh, important, let's say, ideological function, if you want, um, uh, where it's, uh, I mean, discourse is, is about to create um, large political subjects, right? And then the other thing is, and that's, I think, where policymaking is so interesting as an example, and, and your example is ex extremely interesting, um, where in, in that ideological space of, um, of polarized political subjectivities, some actors are involved in policy making, uh, understood as the creation of uh, the crafting of laws, of rules, um, the um, or the decision making about very concrete issues, and of course, there's no direct translation between both. And um, and I think what what we saw in your talk is mainly about that polarizing, let's say, ideological aspect of political discourse, whereas there's this that all the, that whole other area of policy making, which is extremely complex, where you need experts. I mean, I guess the first um, the first area of 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 political discourse. I mean, here you see the Johnsons, right? The people um, who are good at slogan making, um, who um, come across in a certain way on TV, um, who have no comp competence whatsoever in, in in a particular policy field, and then the other. Uh, actors are not kind of uh, anchored in, in a very specific area where, where you need to know what's going on, where certain actors uh, work, behave in certain ways. And, um, and in a way, um, the question is how through discourses, which in a way respond to both areas, how these dynamics are organized. And um, um, I, I, I guess if, if you take a local council with a much smaller social space um of course i mean people will be much more kind of identifiable in the discourse because um uh, people probably will know each other a bit more and um and whereas on on a more kind of um, national level i mean discourses will be much more abstract and um and so um uh, but i, I guess that even those very abstract discourses can be extremely successful. And I would still say that Thatcher uh, on certain standards was very successful um, in that, that she, um, I mean, she was reelected twice. Um, she, um, she forged identities that was very successful. And she definitely, she intervened in, in all kinds of policy fields in a very, very substantial and consequential way. So um, um, yeah, uh, Maybe that's that's my general comment to to your uh, very interesting project. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I I I, <clears throat> I do agree. Um, I I don't. Yeah, I mean it's it's difficult. It's it's, it's always a problem, isn't it? That um, you kind of you you get some examples, and then there's always more there's always more that needs to be said and, and, can, and can be said and, and should be said uh, and more analysis that we can do and i think uh, um i guess what i'm proposing is that if we, we, yeah, <laughs> there's more work to be done um if we can and i'm, I'm not comparing like with like here but if we if we were to, to be able to identify a national policy that we could see as a success and do a comparative analysis there and see if there is more, a, a more detailed elaboration of of its core kind of ideas uh, compared with one that's that's kind of less successful in terms of gas that's I, I think what i'm trying to say is that I, I i i agree with what you're saying about the abstraction policy texts are abstract um especially in the kind of legislative phase um but I think what we can do is actually empirically test that by doing a comparative analysis if we can identify something that we kind of agree is successful versus something that we agree is is not not is a policy produces a policy failure. Um, so so on that, I, I think there's there's certainly I think quite exciting possibilities uh, to 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 do that kind of work. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of that's for for the future. Um, on the set, on this, the, the other point about whether we see the, the you know whether 
Thatcher was successful or was successful uh, and, and whether this policy was successful. Yeah, uh, I think I would I would kind of come push back at that and say what I'm looking at is policy as policy, not policy as, particular, as part of political project. And, and where, yeah. I, where I'd agree um, that your you, she was, she was successful in terms of elections and, and changing the ideology and, and changing perhaps the ideolo ideological landscape of large parts of the world. Um, I, I'm kind of trying to be a bit more focused on that and uh, on, on the, the kind of policy consequences. And, and this is, I mean, I had that definition from McConnell earlier on, and this is one of the, the kind of things I was getting at. There are other ways of assessing success, but I, I really want to kind of say, well, you know, I mean, this kind of comes out of this the, the kind of discourse of new labor several years ago where where they were saying things like we want to have evidence-based policy and they're not really having evidence-based policy but I, I want to kind of don't want to let go of that idea and say well we can can, can we um actually assess on their own terms the aims of a policy and see if we can prefigure or diagnose whether it's likely to succeed or fail. So it's a, so it's a slightly different thing there. I, I'm slightly slightly yeah. different. Um, yeah, that's really 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 great. I mean, I think that's a very very interesting research program, and um, all kinds of examples uh, pop up in, in in our minds, right? I mean, um, the last example of of a massive policy failure, of course, is trustonomics and Brexit, and um, and I mean, you definitely see how this really ties in with these um, polarized discourses about, um, I mean, abstract notions of the market. And, and it's not about the market, it's about people who are for the market, right? And, um, and, and, and they defend their identity. So it's, it's no longer really about um, um, whether the policy will, will succeed or not. I think that's, that's a very important thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. And interestingly, Rowan, who, who can't use her microphone at the moment, has put something in the chat that, that goes in a similar direction, sort of asking. Um, so thank you, very interesting. But call me cynical, but I would like to know who do you, who you think the policy documents are for? Who is their readership and who are the government actually hoping to persuade? If we think of Liz Truss, there she is, yeah. uh, we could imagine that her real audience was Tufton Street rather than the public, the Conservative Party, or even her own cabinet. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I think it goes in a in a similar direction. Who the policy papers are for? I think this is a bit of yeah, looking yeah. at different genres. But I, I think you you said this in in your talk as well that that you you you're aware that you look didn't quite compare like with like there. Yeah, <laughs> sure, and and I, and I think and uh, of course you know uh, as people interested in discourse and text, I, I think it, it is clear that 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 texts serve multiple functions. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, in the case, I mean, you know, there's an easy shot there, so, but I'm, I'm going to take it anyway. You know, trust, trust his policies were, 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 were policy failures and political failures. <laughs> so, you know, um, she didn't she didn't get anything right. But I can't, I kind of started feeling sorry for her a little bit. But um, um, I, 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 yes. So, so let, let me just address the specific question. Who are policy texts for? Yeah, there are multiple functions for for policy texts. Partly, they're setting mood music for for people who work in a particular part of the policy area. But I, I mean, I have done research in in government departments and on particular policies, yeah, quite extensive actually. Um, and it, it it's very clear. I mean, people. people People have said to me, people who work in policy and political departments have sometimes said to me, well, nobody reads them. Why is it, why are you interested? And, and that's not actually true. People do read them. When you talk to se senior civil servants in um, Westminster, they're very aware of what previous policy documents uh, have said. They know what the content is and they know actually what the current policy, if there's a policy area, they will know what the last policy document produced on that area is. And they will consider it to be the policy that continues until a new one is brought in to, to replace it. And they will refer to that and they, that that will shape their actions, their thinking, their kind of advice to ministers and so on. So that it, the policy documents do have an effect. They might not, it's, of course, it's not, it's not the, it might not have the um, exact effect that, that people might imagine, but they, they do have, they are used and they are discussed and they are known about amongst people, you know, a handful of people maybe. 
but but important people nonetheless because they're the ones that are making decisions and and taking actions uh, that's in within government and if it's a policy area such as i don't know such as um i don't know let me think of of one that i was looking at i was looking at um some defra policies and people who work out in in region regional offices we, are aware of of what the national policy is and they kind of they kind of work to it not maybe they'll try and subvert it maybe they'll try and ignore bits that they don't like but they will refer to policy documents so yeah they might not be widespread you know they're not like um they're not um popular fiction they're not widely widely read but but they do have i, I would say they do have an effect they do have a, 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 a they are used um by, by certain people uh, that's what i would say about that one Brilliant. So uh, Brendan's hand has gone down now. Does that mean you the question is answered? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't want to intrude on time too much, but uh, really enjoyed the, the, the session. I suppose I would worry about to what extent is the difference in discourse to do with the difference in genres rather than uh, but uh, so I, but uh, but that's a, a kind of uh, I suppose one that can be addressed by looking at at uh, maybe local policies as covered in the media, yeah. uh, and comparing it with the president. The other kind of thing occurred to me as we were talking about success was that maybe your method or your approach could tell us more about how the discourse might predict success in different ways so i suppose the hows of success more than a yes or no of success so can a policy that actually succeeds in its own terms be predicted by a kind of level of specification of the kind of that you were hinting at whereas maybe a policy that succeeds as part of an overall uh, discursive shift or an attempt to shift the society ideologically might be composed of some other textual features. Uh, I was just thinking about that as you spoke, but really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brendan. Yeah, I think that, that's great, actually. And uh, you know, this is incredibly helpful, actually. I, I think that's a, the, all, all of the questions are really kind of pointing to ways that this this could be developed. And I, I think that's a that's a really good one also yeah what kind of effect does it have in terms of what kind of success so i like that i like that idea of what kind of success um might different types of elaboration uh, be involved in i think that's a very very interesting one and I, in fact i think we could link that back to johannes question there if 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 you see you know the the, the ideological success of the privatization agenda maybe that's what comes from this vagueness and absence uh, you know uh, uh, and, and so on because it's a it's a space that we can put our fantasies into isn't it because there's nothing specific there um whereas something that's more detailed might not capture the public imagination but might then produce um you know a actually successful policies in their own terms so i think that's a you know as a hypothesis i think that's very very interesting one and, and actually quite a plausible one so good one to good one to look at yeah you need to do i need to get some research done <laughs> um as Thank i you. don't yeah. see another hand i would like to jump in with one uh because i've been thinking about this this these these two sort of key words that you worked out there collabor mm -hmm. collaboration cooperation and, and, and competition and them sort of staying as staying as empty signifiers right on the surface of of this policy of these policy texts but the question that i would find interesting and you know what's coming now because you, you know my, my my talk on on sustainability is how is it interpreted how how do these textual trajectories work how are people then talking about this are they picking this up as empty or not and that would be the interesting mm -hmm. bit but this is very difficult to grasp isn't it in in the different genres and and through the different conversations but um, I, I hope to to be able to see something like this when I look at policy texts on net zero and then see how local councils debate that. Do they pick this up or do they just continue using the empty signifier? Because on the surface, it's really true. You know, it's, there's competition. And there's no explanation of what competition should look like. And and all of us as cynics sort of know, you know, what's the competition on the railways where you can take the train or you can leave it? Um, 
<laughs> so, yeah. so it's, I think that there, there are, there's a bit more sort of methodological development probably through through sort of linguistic ethnography to be done. The trouble is always sort of having the time yeah. and the resources to actually do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad you raised that. I, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm very. I'm very aware. I mean, I. I kind of just in, in response to kind of comment in the in, in the comments about saying, well, I've, I've been. I've been into DEFRA and some of the other ministries and kind of looked at that. Um, I, I haven't done that with with this particular thing. That, so, I'm, and I'm very aware that you you get a far richer picture of how the the, the kind of texts. Uh, are used, uh, how they they kind of uh, are disseminated, how the kind of discourses tend to be picked up or not picked up, how they, you know, all of that. And, and I'm really glad that you mentioned linguistic ethnography because I think that is something that that really is a useful. I mean, if only we had the time. If only I had the time. <laughs> <laughs> to do to do that, I, I you know that would be what I would do. It, it, it's absolutely right. So you know, if anybody fancies putting a proposal together to do a linguistic ethnography of um, policy development, yeah, I'm I'd be all in for that. Absolutely, I think it's um, um, a, a really really important kind of area to 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 build into this. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Any other questions or comments? I think our time is sort of also up but if there's one more um otherwise i say thank you very much michael it was really uh, interesting and, and and inspiring so um great sort of also to sort of think about sort of the methodological details was very i find that very very useful um and uh, just val already put in the chat our next uh, open discourse net uh talk is on the 27th of january um alan phyllis and on the rhetoric of reactionary digital politics. Um, I find Alan always quite uh, interesting um, because he's a political scientist and not really, uh, not, not, not a linguist, not a social scientist, and it comes from more from rhetoric. Um, uh, he will always say, oh God, I'm amongst the political scientists, I'm the language guy. Uh, so it will be very, uh, very interesting. So it'd be great to see you all again um and up until then i say have a have a good christmas and uh, a good start into the new year hopefully some time to to rest i think we all might need that and uh, hope to see you again thank you very much thank you bye thank you.